experiments ever. Uh, we had uh, the ability to buy anything pretty much to build uh, a research center to create the future. Um, and And poor Ted had to run the craziest of, of uh, research labs where, where uh, tarot cards were read for people to ma marry people in the research lab and various things happened. Um, yes, it is true. Uh, Brent, Brenda Laurel married uh, Eric Altine after tarot cards were read. I was in the office when, when it was read and various other things happened. But, uh, um, and we did have a, uh, the Atari, the logo of the, of, the, of, the, of the company was on the bottom of the hot tub. Uh, there was, there was a var variety of strange things. Anyway, he was a vice president. I believe that the Atari, for the honor of being vice president, bought him a Jaguar to yeah. drive. Uh, and uh, <laughs> so he drove to work in this Jaguar that Atari had, had purchased for his benefit. But, but the fact is that uh, Ted has made, uh, been, been one of the major inventors in the Valley uh, and uh, just, just got awards even this year for, for algorithms and hardware that he invented 50, 50 uh, years ago. At lunch, he was telling me about a about a strange memory that he invented that that actually plated and uh, plated copper and uh, and then unplated it on a, rod, uh, a rhodium uh, a rhodium um, uh, substrate as as the way of of, of holding a memory cell. Uh, you know, so many years ago, and still has I guess a few of these running. If you need to buy um, a, a non volatile memory for some purpose, forgive me for for too much of this. I, I'm really proud and honored to have Ted, Ted speak with us today, and thank you for uh, coming. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Well, let me get started. A little bit about my background. I was very fortunate to get interested in science and technology at a very young age, about nine years old. My uncle was only 12 years older than I was. He came back from World War II. He'd been in the Navy, and he became a chemical engineer at the University of Rochester in Rochester, New York, where I was living at the time. And he would give me his chemistry books when he was through with them, and I started reading those. Then he gave me a subscription to Popular Science Magazine when I was about 12, and I saw an ad for an Allied radio catalog. It was free. What could go wrong? And so anyway, sent away for the catalog. Before long, I was buying books. And my parents were quite nice. And they got me a shortwave radio kit. And I remember at one point, I was actually listening to an English language broadcast from Radio Moscow. Now, this was the peak of you know the McCarthy era. So as I said, that was quite subversive. I also saw an ad in Popular Science from a New York City surplus house for a five inch cathode ray tube. I sent away for it, and built myself a crude little oscilloscope. Well, anyway, that interest in chemistry really helped out. My science teacher at our high school realized I had quite a chemistry background, suggested I enter what was then called the Westinghouse Science Talent Search. And I was fortunate enough to win a trip to Washington. There I am at age 16 in, in Washington, DC, demonstrating uh, what was hopefully going to be a way of converting carbon dioxide and hydrogen into synthetic fuel to be prepared for the day when fossil fuels run out. But it was a very nice, positive feedback. One of those things in life that convinces you maybe you're on the right career path. <laughs> now, my father worked at General Railway Signal Company in, a, in a one part of it. He was not into electronics, but more into relay circuits. But he got me an interview uh, in their electronics lab. And the fact that I had built the oscilloscope and so on, they offered me a summer job. This turned out to be a tremendous advantage because started in 54, that was the year I graduated high school. And I got to work with transistors, which were only seven years old at this time. In fact, um, I was going to Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute uh, studying electrical engineering. And I 
typically found I probably knew more about transistors than any of the instructors or professors there because at this point electronics meant vacuum tubes. Well, <clears throat> my second summer at this summer job had an unusual, <laughs> at least I think of an unusual situation. I was assigned to work with two engineers to help them put together a, a track circuit for railroads that would operate at about 10 kilohertz. Now this circuit was going to be used in a, to override a safety feature. And they're very much concerned about safe failure. So in this case, the idea was it was going to detect the presence of a train, but a safe failure was not to detect the train. Well, in the course of this, it occurred to me that it's very hard to build an amplifier, which you need to detect the 10 kilohertz, without the danger of it breaking into oscillation and giving a false positive. So I raised the issue, is it possible we could make a passive receiver, no amplification? We would need a sensitive enough relay. And it turned out the company, General Railway Signal Company, which made relays, had the perfect relay for the purpose. It would pick up on a tenth of a watt. We were dumping about a watt of 10 kilohertz into the railroad. And so that relay was perfect. We could use a passive receiver. We also had to couple the system to the tracks through a capacitor. And it occurred to me, since we're, the circuit was making use of the inductance of the rails, which at 10 kilohertz was pretty significant, so that you wouldn't detect a shunt unless it was very close to where you were connected. So it seemed to me if we made the capacitor the right size, we could make a series resonant circuit. Well, they liked that too, and it was adopted. At the end of that summer, I'm getting ready to go back to college, and the engineers come to me and say, uh, by the way, we're going to be filing for a patent on this system, and we're naming you as a co-inventor. So suddenly I was an inventor. And this was the filing information on the patent. It was filed just a few weeks before I turned 18 years old. So again, one of those bits of positive feedback that say, you know, I think I found the right kind of... Uh, profession for myself. <laughs> now, I went to Rensselaer Polytechnic uh, Institute and um, studied electronics there until 1958 when I got uh, my bachelor's degree. And I was very fortunate again. I applied for and was awarded a National Science Foundation fellowship. So that would allow me to go to graduate school. Now, as of this time, I had been to Washington, D.C., but I had never been west of Niagara Falls, New York, <laughs> maybe more than 10 miles anyway. What about California? And, and this is 1958, and we're starting to hear some things about interesting things going on in California. So I applied to Stanford. They accepted me, and I came out to Stanford. And in fact, when I arrived at Stanford, I found they had just hired a fellow from Bell Labs named John Mall, passed away recently, sadly. But he taught a course in solid state electronics. And while I'd had all those years of working with transistors, and I could say I knew how they worked, I didn't know why they worked. With his course, finally I knew why they worked. And it was a, a great, great experience. So. In graduate school, if you're going to go on for the PhD, you need a thesis topic. And in that summer job, I had heard about a problem, and I thought, I wonder if a thesis topic could be generated from this. The issue was the railroads would like to keep track of where all the different railroad cars are. And every railroad car has its own unique serial number. But see, they're traveling all over the country, and the railroads are trying to keep track of where they are because it's stuff they own. Is there the possibility we could build a system that would read the numbers off a railroad car as it went rolling by? And so I mentioned that to uh, the head of the E department. They said, we've got just the fellow you need to meet. They had just uh, brought uh, Professor Bernie Woodrow from MIT to join the Stanford faculty, and so I became 
his first uh, PhD uh, student. Now, he had a firm belief that if you're going to build a pattern recognition system, it had to have some degree of self-optimization, some degree of adaptation built into it. And in the course of that, we developed and published uh, what we call the LMS algorithm. And I'll say a little bit about that. Um, it came about the following. You could think of pattern recognition, but it could be used in a variety of other ways. Now, in the case of pattern recognition, I'll call them events, but the event is we have put a particular letter, let's say, in front of a, a camera or some type of optical sensor. But another event might be a set of measurements that are, let's say, of related to weather, like temperature and pressure. And we're hopefully going to use that to determine what the weather is, let's say, in San Francisco tomorrow. And there were a whole variety of things. So each event or occurrence, like the presence of a letter in front of a camera, could be represented by a set of measurements. And we would call that set of measurements a vector. Now, to do a classifier for each of those vectors, we would like to have this box that we're going to build give a particular response. So we call that the desired response. And we got a bunch of parameters in that box that are going to hopefully process that information and come up with the desired response. But at any one point, we only get an actual response. So we want to find a way to improve that response. Well, we measure an error for each of those events. We generate an aggregate error for the set of events. And now we're going to try to do an algorithm that's going to minimize that aggregate error. The thing that was so surprising to us, even though it's an aggregate, we turned out the algorithm said you do one event at a time and you make a change that is based only on the response of the system to that one event, which meant then that we could do the adaptation on the fly. In other words, as things come in and we know what they are, we can classify the machine. We don't have to store an awful lot of data. And this algorithm has been used for antenna beam formation and sonar beam formation, for adaptive equalizers and modems, for noise canceling and a very large number of other, other applications. Now, I was working at Stanford teaching a little bit, but mostly working on research sponsored by government contract. And it seemed like a pretty, pretty secure position. And um, I get a phone call. This was 1968, so I'd been about six years after I got my PhD from Bob Noyce, fellow on the left, and he, I had met him once before when we put on a speech recognition demonstration, but he told me he was starting a new company and would I be interested in talking to him about a position. Well, I found out the company only had $3 million in financing. I didn't know how long that was going to last, but I figured, what the heck, I was young enough and hopefully would be able to get a job even if this uh, company didn't work out. So, uh, so I joined Intel. And in fact, one of those things, again, lucky guess, one of the things Bob asked me is, what did I think the next big thing in semiconductor technology application would be? Well, I had worked with magnetic core memory, and I knew it was pretty difficult. And I've actually been talking to some people from Fairchild who used to come around to talk to us about our students, about what was going on. And I just sort of off the top of my head said, memory. I didn't know at the time, but Bob and Gordon's plans were to start a memory company <laughs> to make semiconductor memory. About a year after the company was founded, um, the director of marketing and I published an article. In fact, I have a copy of the original journal here, in which we predicted we'd get the cost of memory below a penny a bit by 1972. Uh, you look back and think of how much that is. Today, actually my numbers on the slide I think are off. The last I saw you could buy memory for a digital camera and get something in the order of a hundred million bits of non-volatile memory for every penny you spend. So the 
we met the target and overshot it <laughs> last year. But one of the one of the problems that a company like Intel was facing, we were going to be making these semiconductor memory chips and hopefully selling them to big computer companies. Those companies were pretty conservative. They were well established with magnetic core memory. And we figured it's going to take a while before they are um, ready to buy semiconductor memory in quantity. So what do you do to generate some revenue while your main market's developing? Well, you take on some side projects for specific customers. And hopefully the minute you can make something for them, they're ready to buy it. And our first such customer sold calculators under the name Busycom. In April of 69, so the company was less than a year old, we agreed to make LSI for a calculator family. Didn't know what exactly was involved, but the company just said, yeah, we'll do it. And in June of that year, three engineers arrived from Japan to transfer the design. Now, several writers have said I was assigned to do the design. That is not true. In fact, I like to emphasize it. My job was just liaison. But I was just supposed to help those engineers transfer their design and otherwise stay out of their way. But being a curious sort, um, I was wondering, you know, had had some experience with computers and IBM 1620 and IBM 1130, uh, even a PDP-8. So I had some idea what was in the computer, but yeah, what's in the calculator? So I'm curious about this design, and it leads to some questions. The, the project appears much more complicated, uh, something like maybe as many as a dozen chips, each of which is of significant complexity. And Intel, I think, at the time had only two MOS designers on the staff. The other thing is it had a read-only memory in it that was going to be used to um, customize the chipset for use in a number of different calculators. But the instructions that were being executed out of read-only memory were almost like the level of floating point ed, were quite high level. And they were planning to use shift register memory. Now, at the time at Intel, we were working toward a three transistor uh, dynamic RAM cell. And so it seemed to me the shift register, which took six transistors to store a bit, could be replaced with the DRAM, which would use only three transistors. And where the shift register, you have to wait for the data to go by, DRAM essentially is like one microsecond access. So it seemed like it would have advantages, and it would have advantages towards simplifying the instruction set make it simpler, more primitive, and then do the more complicated functions by multi-level subroutines. In other words, where a subroutine can call a subroutine and so on. And so I started working on an alternate design. And in fact, I have a paper here. By September of that year, um, our marketing department sent a proposal to Japan and they quoted two chipset prices. One would be for the design brought by the Japanese engineering team, which was not interested in my approach at all, and basically what my approach was. And at this point, we even had an estimate. There were to be two chips that made up the CPU, a timing chip and an arithmetic chip, and one was quoted as 1,800 transistors. That was the arithmetic. And the other was quoted as 500 transistors for a total of about 2,300. Later on, we would combine those two chips. And depending on how you counted it, you either ended up with 2,100 or 2,300 transistors in the 4004. But that proposal, even in September, had the instruction set and the basic architecture specified. And other people have claimed they brought the idea to Intel much later. But this document shows that was the case. Well, we made the microprocessor. The Japanese management chose our design. We went ahead, developed the chips. They were available fairly early in 1971. But the next job was selling it 
within Intel itself. The marketing people felt, how can we sell memory chips to computer companies if we're in the computer business ourselves? And so as a result, there was a, a lot of anxiety about should we offer these products? And the other feeling was, well, maybe the calculator company will make or buy all we can make. But we had a change in marketing in the summer of 1971. And this also helped change the attitude. And by November of 1971, in fact, this ad appeared in Electronic News. It was November 15th of 1971. And that was the same day that the Fall Joint Computer Conference opened in Las Vegas, Nevada. So Stan Mazur, who worked with me, uh, went to that conference and he told about meeting customers who came in and had seen the ad. And first, they couldn't believe that it was actually a computer on a chip. And he'd show them the spec and they said, yes, it really is. So they, they were convinced. And now, you've probably heard the term Moore's Law. But I'd like to try to put it in perspective and, and maybe give you a little bit of feeling why architecture at any point in time can be important. We were running two-inch wafers. These are circular slices of silicon, uh, about 20, 30 thousandths of an inch thick. The 4004, with its little over 2,000 transistors, came in at about a 50th of a square inch. Now, you'd think that a two-inch wafer would have three or more square inches. But you see, the wafer's round, and the individual chips are rectangular. So you lose a certain amount around the edge of the wafer. So instead of getting 150 sites, it's more like 125. And at a particular point in time, you probably don't want to be more aggressive than what gives you about a 10% yield. So suppose we did get a 10% yield. That would mean we'd get somewhere around 12 functional devices for each wafer we process. That's $4 for the chip. By the time it's packaged and tested and so on, probably costs $5. Our quantity one price was $60. And in high volume, we'd probably bring it down to 15 But that's still marking it up by a factor of three. So a nice profit on that. Suppose, on the other hand, we overshot and we needed 4,000 transistors, same layout density. Now we've got about a 25th of a square inch uh, instead of a 50th. We don't even get half as many die sites because the bigger uh, chip means we lose more of the periphery to that edge effect. So now maybe we have 50 sites. But look at each of those new devices. You could think of it as two of the smaller ones side by side. And if the yield of any one of those is 10%, the yield of both of them is 1%. Now we are getting maybe one functional device for every two wafers we process. And it's costing us at least $100 each for them. If we're going to sell them and make equivalent profit, in fact, we're probably not going to sell nearly as many, so we'd like to get more profit for each one. So we'd want to sell them for at least like $300 a piece. But here's the problem. At this point, our potential customer had an alternative design. He could go out and buy small scale and medium scale logic devices at maybe 25 cents a package, mount them on a circuit board, and the finished cost would be maybe a dollar to two dollars a package. So for three hundred dollars, he could maybe put a hundred and fifty of these things down on a circuit board. And he would have a processor that was probably at least an order of magnitude and maybe two orders of magnitude more powerful than this device done in MOS. So in effect, overshoot and you probably end up with no sales at all. <laughs> so that was one of the reasons why we had to pay attention to where we were in technology. Well, we actually, at the time, had already committed to the 4004, which was the first one. We had a contact with a company in Texas and agreed to develop a processor for them. In fact, it was 
Intel that proposed we do their device as a single chip processor. Their original request to us was actually for a memory chip to go in a processor. That became our 8008, and it actually became available about a year after the 4004 became available, and it had about 3,300 transistors on it. The feedback from the 8008 led us to the 8080, and we ended up with a new process, an N-channel MOS process, which gave us higher performance than the process we had used in the earlier microprocessors. That was the first part that would really have what you'd call mini computer class performance. So now this is coming out. We actually had parts in 73. So it's roughly three years after the 4004, and it had about 4,500 transistors. So you see it's sort of following Moore's law in a relatively conservative fashion. And, and I happen to remember on that, we ran about 20 functional devices per wafer. In fact, one of the things that was kind of a funny story. We sold 8080s in single quantities at $360 a piece. High quantities to be down around 20. But anyway, one day the head of the MOS department walks into the lab and there's 8080 wafers laying all over the place. Now, the engineers are thinking them as $50 each. And suddenly the boss says, well, wait a minute. If those were packaged and sold, those are $7,000 each. <laughs> and there's uh, like a million dollars worth of product laying around on the bench. Maybe we should take a little different attitude toward this. So we had to become a little more careful in how we, how we handled resources of the company. So the 8080 was actually one of the first processors to lead to uh, some personal computers, uh, Altair, MIPS, and so on. And uh, uh, a very successful product, and then subsequent came after that. But I dropped out of the microprocessor game some time about then because Bob Noyce came to me around 74, 75, and asked me to take a look at the telephone industry. And is there something we could do for the telephone industry that would make sense for Intel and make sense for them? Well, at first it was kind of an exercise in frustration to try to figure out what we would do. In fact, I think I once went to my boss and I said, it's almost like we were going to go to Pacific Gas and Electric and ask them to deliver 5 volts DC instead of 220 volts AC to the home <laughs> builder because we wanted to run logic. But finally came up with the idea there was a standardized analog to digital and digital to analog conversion process that was used in the telephone industry, and it seemed to me we might be able to do that. And we actually were successful in developing uh, this device. And the device was called a codec. It actually has both the analog to digital and digital to analog conversion for a, it's a very, um, standardized but somewhat unique uh, encoding of data. It's actually a piecewise linear approximation to a logarithmic um, encoding curve. Now, I used MOS for this, and to some extent, um, it seemed like analog processing was a less obvious use for MOS technology. It makes a great switch but there was concern that it wouldn't make a good amplifier, particularly because it had noise issues. But the noise tended to be very low frequency, and for telephony, the main interest is in frequencies from 200 hertz to about 4 kilohertz. In fact, at one point, I was interested in um, making a D to A converter by just running a series of, you know, a, a series string of resistors and then using a MOS device as a switch to select a tap. But I wanted to know how well the resistors would match. So I went to my boss, who was sort of like the resident expert on MOS, and asked him if I put two resistors side by side, how close will they be? He said, not very good. I said, I want a quantitative number, not a qualitative number. Then he admitted he didn't know. So now the question is, is there a way to find out? Well, Intel made 
wafers of test devices. And each test device had at least one of each type of resistor on it. So I got some of these wafers and started measuring. And sure enough, the resistors had different values. But if you plotted the resistance of a resistor versus the position on the wafer, you found out it was a very smooth, straight line. There was a gradient effect of resistivity across the wafer. But now the idea is I fitted a curve to this and said, how much does it deviate from a straight line curve? And it indicated, printed side by side, those resistors would match to about less than 1% error. So I had the technique to make a DAC, and that turned out to be the way we did it in our first codec. And then another thing, nice to have a voltage reference built into the D-Day converter. And it started doing some experiments. We had a process that had both enhancement and depletion devices. So one of these has a positive threshold voltage, and the other one has a negative threshold voltage. If we take the difference of the two, we're actually adding the magnitudes. And it turned out, measurements indicated it was a remarkably stable uh, voltage source. Because whatever would change the threshold of one transistor would change the threshold of the other in the same way, and we were taking the difference of those, those numbers. At the same time, we were lucky. We got a professor from Berkeley, Paul Gray, to come and consult for us. And he had a sabbatical coming up. He joined my group, and he led a small team that came out with, I believe, the first commercially available switch capacitor filter. So we had the whole package needed for the telephone application. And this really was like, like a step in moving toward the digital domain. We could now put the conversion very close to the handset. Another experience, maybe not quite as successful, but when we designed the codec, we designed it in a way that we felt would be very useful in switching systems. But there are other functions that take place, like in a PABX or other types of switch. And we felt if we had some type of a digital signal processor, we could do those operations digitally as well. And we de defined and developed a, um, a digital signal processing chip that had the A to D and D to A converters and EEPROM memory all in one chip and an instruction set that tended to make it have a fixed sample rate. But it really wasn't successful. Most of the applications that this would have found, uh, you know, would have been used for, uh, ended up using switch capacitor filters instead. So it, uh, and maybe half a decade or a decade later, uh, other people went into the uh, digital signal processing arena. So uh, we kind of dropped the ball on that one. But that was a, um, a, an interesting experience to, to try to do that. Well, Intel was moving closer and closer to being primarily semiconductors. They moved the telephone group to Arizona, and I didn't want to go to Arizona. Uh, I started a, a speech recognition activity at Intel, but it was a relatively small activity. And then I was approached by Atari. Now, Atari had some of the most interesting concepts. Uh, their R&D lab had some very far-sighted people and some very interesting thoughts about how computers might find application in the home and in other places in human activity. The only trouble was Intel as a company was run by Andy Grove with an iron fist and very tight control. Atari didn't have that degree of control. It was rather disorganized. <laughs> and it also, at the time, was owned by Warner Communication. And that is an entertainment company. And the entertainment company, I think, if you look at entertainment as a business, somewhat fundamentally different than what you think of as the computer industry. So I think some of these things worked against them. The other thing is it may be some of the concepts were actually ahead of what the underlying technology would be able to deliver. You know, you go back to that cost of 
memory, I mentioned a penny a bit in 1972. Well, think about one typewritten page. It would be about $300 worth of memory for one typewritten page. So you're not likely to make a, an inexpensive personal computer in 1972 if you want to be able to, say, write a 10-page article. You're going to have $3,000 worth of And that's memory at the chip level. I mean, put it in the system and power supplies and everything else. But over the years, that cost has been coming down. Well, anyway, after Atari, it was sold in 84. And um, one of the people I worked with at Atari started a company called Teclicon, which did consulting for attorneys dealing with intellectual property. And again, an experience. Um, I was doing some consulting, and I quoted one person on an engineering job, and he says, boy, you are expensive. And then I quoted the same fee to an attorney who was looking for testimonial witness. He says, boy, you're really reasonable. So I knew where the money was. It was in, it was in the, the legal area. And so I worked at that for 20 years. And it was really fun because I could make use of my home uh, facility and so on. Now, the microprocessor, I mean, we could, everybody th I think, thinks it's a success, although the media tends to think of it primarily in terms of the personal computer. Our original view was embedded control, and I like to tell young people in particular, I'm an, an example of embedded control. For some 20 years now, I've had a cardiac pacemaker embedded in me, and it has a microprocessor in it. So. Someone said, it must be kind of nice to know that something you worked on helped save your life, and it actually it is. The EEPROM, that was developed by Dove Froman. He had a bench right next to mine at Intel, and he was working on the EEPROM while I was developing programming and other things for, for the 4004. And Moore's Law, the idea that every year we get better at making semiconductor integrated circuits. Well, one of the things that really impacts that is scaling. The smaller things are, the better. Now, it was actually Bob Denard, who's also credited with being an inventor of the um, single transistor dynamic RAM cell. And he showed in a paper published in 1974 the advantages of making particularly MOS circuits smaller. Cut the linear dimension in half. Well, you got four times as many circuits for a given amount of silicon. You scale the voltages down, each one runs at a quarter of the power. Each one runs twice as fast, so you're getting eight times the bang for your buck. Well, back in 74, we were in the five to 10,000 nanometer range. We've come down, in fact, we're now, I believe, a little below 20 nanometers. And I've talked to people, people are talking about getting down below 10. But I question how much farther we can go. And that is, as you shrink the circuit, first of all, you're shrinking the operating voltage, so you're shrinking the signal voltages. And the signal to noise degrades. Now here's, there is a noise that gets bigger as you make things smaller. And if you look at the noise, the equation for it says the noise voltage is the geometric mean of two numbers. One number is this 26 or so millivolts at room temperature for KT over Q. And the other number is the voltage associated with a single electron on a minimum geometry capacitor. So as we shrink by scaling by a factor of 10, we reduce the capacitor by a factor of 10. So that voltage comes up by 10. The KT over Q stays constant. It's the square root of 10 is the effect. And so there's 10 dB. A 10-fold reduction signal is 20 dB, so we end up with 30 dB degradation for every factor of 10. Now, 20 dB, the logic reliability is pretty good. Make the assumption Gaussian noise and so on. We're looking at an error rate of something like 10 to the minus 22, which means we can be putting you know, 10 to the 9th or 10 to the 10th circuits down running them at 10 to the 9th or 10 to the 10th operations per second and still run for an hour without any errors. But suppose we try to make things smaller. In fact, somebody said, let's use redundancy. Let's do a mind experiment. We cut the size in half. 
Now the signal to noise ratio goes to about 11 dB. But if we're going to use redundancy, we need three copies of the circuit. Now, cutting in half cut the area by four, but now we're back to three-fourths of the original area. But we need a voter circuit to vote on the output. So now that's probably as big as the logic. So now we're back, no area advantage. Now, the circuit, the smaller circuit ran twice as fast. But we've got to go through the voter channel as well. So now we've probably used up our speed advantage. But when you use redundancy, the 11 dB gives you an error rate of something like 10 to the minus 6 or so. You use redundancy, you get a product. So you get maybe 10 to the minus 12. So we've got no speed advantage, no power advantage, no area advantage, but 10 orders of magnitude worse performance in area. So I say redundancy doesn't help. So I had a chance to talk to one researcher from Mitchell. He says, I'm a little too pessimistic, but this, this one, I hope to live long enough to see what happens. <laughs> now, I've been dabbling with computers now for something like 50 years. <laughs> My first experience was 1961 with an IBM 1620. And you look at the enormous increase in performance. But one of the things that doesn't seem to me at least I certainly would like to see more capability, is what I call natural language understanding by computers. I mean, people come out with new computer languages all the time, but it seems like every computer language is designed to be context independent, and that's not the way natural language works. The other one, and I'll talk a little bit more about both of these, is material research. But let, let me go into a little bit more about natural language. As I say, most computer languages are designed to be context independent. And, but if you look at natural language, in fact, some experiments that were done in speech recognition, if you ask a person to recognize words without the context, the performance, if anything, is as bad or worse than the typical speech recognition. Having context makes a huge difference in a human being's ability to understand words. So it seems to me this would be a reasonable first step, at least starting to bring some ability to process context. And I can think of applications, you know, like you know, maybe in the area of like patent processing or something, where we would be able to do a degree of context to establish the meanings of at least, let's say, technical terms. But um, I don't know if anybody knows where I, I, I certainly don't hear much about. And uh, when I have a chance to talk to people, they say, well, there's work going on, but it seems to me we, uh, we could be doing more. The other one, I, I, I probably don't know enough to know how much I don't know <laughs> on this one, but it strikes me that we are becoming very risk averse as a society. And that we do not even train many people uh, in some of the areas that are important for material research. Uh, I mean, my first love was chemistry. and I played a lot with chemicals and I'm certainly burned holes in clothes and things like that. And probably inhaled a lot of stuff that I shouldn't have. In fact, that first photograph of me in Washington, D.C., you probably couldn't see from the photograph but that apparatus had a fair amount of asbestos in it, and I lived here to, to tell the, <laughs> the story. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, today they find a trace of asbestos in a building, and they lock it up, and people in spacesuits come out to get the asbestos taken away. I mean, we are very much afraid of this type of thing. I mean, our youngest daughter became a physical therapist and had to take a course in chemistry college level course. They never once went in a lab. Everything was out of a textbook. And somehow that just doesn't feel like chemistry to me. So the question is this. At what level of computer power do we have to reach before we can simulate at the molecular or atomic level 
And I have a few references on this. I know even back in the 50s, they were dealing with like hydrogen molecules where two hydrogen atoms link together. But think of a material, like, like a material I say like potassium nitrate. Most people know of it as used in gunpowder. But you look at the crystal structure it forms when it uh, deposits out of a solution, or crystallizes from a solution. It's solubility characteristics. It has something like a 10 to 1 change in solubility from 0 degrees to 100 degrees centigrade in water. And it's piezoelectric. That is, it was even proposed as the dielectric for a type of um, uh, non-volatile memory. But I think it's probably too temperature sensitive to be used in. So this is something I would love to see somebody starting to say, let's, let's really start to look at this problem. But you need to bring together both you know, physicists and computer scientists and you know, and you've got to have the right leadership to do that. So anyway, coming to the end of this, I look back and I say, I have had an awful lot of fun working with technology. I mean, all of these years, I've been paid to play at my hobby. And I have an extensive shop at home. I'm just glad that nobody told my bosses that I would have been, probably would have done the work for free because I was having so much fun. <laughs> but anyway, it's also nice to be recognized periodically. And I say, sometimes I've gotten to meet some very interesting people. And here are just a few of them. Um, on the left, uh, about a year and a half ago, three of us connected with a microprocessor were recognized with the National Medal of Technology and Innovation and uh, meeting the president there. On the upper right, uh, this was about uh, just last August. Um, this was in recognition of work in a number of fields. And that's Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, who uh, made the presentation. And the bottom picture, that is from some years ago. That's my wife next to me. And this was uh, back around 1997. And that is within the Imperial Palace in Tokyo, Japan, talking with the Emperor and Empress of Japan. The Empress is in, in the background there. I don't, I don't know if I can. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that doesn't, that doesn't work that way. Anyway, so that is what I have for you. We've taken, I think, 15 minutes. And if you have any questions, glad to try to answer. <laughs> uh, please, anybody have a, a question they want to ask uh, to the team in the aisle? Hi. Where's the microphone? I got one. I got one. So what, while you were working on these things, did you realize the importance of them? Or it was more like, I, I just want to solve this problem. And you were kind of down in the, in the lab, just okay. working the, away. And... When it came to the microprocessor, there was a feeling, I think shared by most of us on the technology side, that this was a useful device. If, like as I mentioned, Doug Froman was developing the EEPROM. We needed to build a device to burn EEPROM. And our first one was going to be wired out of small scale logic. And we realized, then they make a change in the EEPROM design and all of that goes out the window. If we had done it with a microprocessor from the beginning, we would have been able to change it just like that. So our second one, we used a 4004 as the basis for the, and in fact, we actually went to one of the companies in Florida that was making programmers and pointed out to them how when a change took place in the EEPROM design within one day. We were able to upgrade our programmer to handle the new EEPROM, where for them it would have been like six weeks. So made a customer that way. <laughs> so there was that aspect of it. Now, we weren't thinking of the personal computer primarily because of the memory issue. We were looking for applications that did, need, did not need a lot of memory. But there were many things like that, like they were used in gas pumps. They were using uh, elevator controllers. In other words, you only have to remember which floors are going to have buttons pushed. And um, in fact, one of the applications we got a kick out of, somebody had computerized cows. They had actually made a collar for the cow that had a microprocessor in it. And whenever the cow went to the salt lick or to the water or whatever, this recorded where the cow was going. And so they could keep track of 
what its what its characteristics were, and then they would record the milk production and correlate everything. So um, that that was a, uh, more than the personal computer. In fact, embedded control was really what we uh, were thinking of. And today, the media seems almost unaware of it. And in fact, in 1996, the three of us connected with this were recognized by the National Inventors Hall of Fame, which was in Akron, Ohio at the time. And when they did the award ceremony, there was an audience of maybe 2,000 people. And they tell the people, you may have driven here in an automobile that was designed with the aid of a notebook computer. And right there, I thought, even they missed it. Probably everybody who drove there was driving there in an automobile that was running under computer control. You see, those computers tend to be invisible, and the media doesn't know about them, and not many other people know about them either. <laughs> yes? I have a question. Intel um, slogan was Intel everywhere or Intel inside. So I have a question. What is your comment when you see the industry? In the last 20 years, the industry have moved to a kind of oligopoly or different monopoly where Amazon goes from the content to the hardware. Excuse me, my English. Okay. So Intel was an open company, and the objective of Intel was to put the technology inside or everywhere. Yeah, okay. In the last 20 years, the, the industry moved to a different uh, platform or different monopoly. You have the yeah. Apple monopoly, you have the Amazon monopoly. Let's go to the Kindle. And when I discussed with Europe or with Japan, everybody is very concerned that this monopoly now could go to the microprocessor. Yeah. And Japan wants to keep an microprocessor industry. Yeah. France or Europe wants to keep an yeah. microprocessor industry. So what is your comment yeah. on the last evolution of this different yeah. platform or monopoly? Well, let me give one example. I don't know maybe whether it's relevant to this or not, but I think once I heard that Bill Gates had given a talk in which a certain version of Windows operating system represented 40 million lines of code. Now, that makes it a pretty impressive undertaking to produce that. But if you stop and think about it, what does an operating system do other than make your computer look a little bit more the way you'd like it to look? In other words, to communicate with you a little bit more than it would by itself. Doesn't this suggest to us that there's something terribly wrong with our hardware architecture if we have to have an operating system with that much code in it, that we're not using the hardware effectively? Do you have any advice to uh, the younger generation that is, I've got a son who's 17 who's looking at college and getting married and SAT scores? And there are several. I mean, one of the reasons for bringing some of this up, you can't get started too early. <laughs> the more you know, the better. And the more curious you are, the better. And encourage that curiosity in young people. And the other, in fact, we've got a 10-year-old uh, grandson and he asked some remarkable questions, and I hope I never <laughs> disappoint him in the answers. <laughs> but it's like satisfying that curious. The other thing people say, well, weren't you just at the right place at the right time? That's probably true. But if you're interested in technology, you make the effort to get yourself in the right place at the right time. Maybe you'll guess wrong, but you have to keep trying. And that, that was one of the things it sounded like what Intel was going to be doing would be interesting. And, and here was the case. We, we had such advantages because we had, at the time, the most advanced MOS process around. So we could do things that maybe other, other companies would not be able to tackle. So, um, you know, the story reads like, you know, this engineering curious guy gets dead problems in software. Right, and then you go over to Atari, where these wild-eyed dreamers um, live and try to fiddle about. And what do you think about the relative merits of these different different styles of, of thought? Well, you have 
you have wild-eyed dreamers, I think, in both ways. The, the problem is that this business of needing discipline, and what Atari seemed to lack was discipline. And there were some active fights against it. But, I mean, you hear the story about, what was it, discovery of the x-ray or something like that, and somebody has some photo film that gets fogged, and, well, there's two choices. They can throw that film out and replace it with something else, or go and ask, now, why did that film get fogged? It was pretty well wrapped. I mean, there's the curiosity. <coughs> and, and one of the concerns is if you're in an undisciplined environment, you could come up with some great discovery, and you probably will never even realize it because you haven't taken the time to write things down and document what you've done and then be able to compare progress over time. And so I think that one of, one of the things that Andy Grove brought to Intel it was called, we call it management by objective. But the idea is on a monthly basis, you would predict what you would accomplish in the next month. And then in a progress report, you would write, you would compare what you would actually accomplish versus your previous month's predictions. And I'll tell you, for a technical guy, and we all think we could just, you know, do anything and everything, it is a real eye opener to see how you overestimated your own capabilities. And the idea of being able to make more accurate predictions of what your own capabilities are, I thought, turned out to be very useful and allow us to make, uh, in other words, design projects and so on and bring them in on budget and on time. That, that's important when you're in a business environment. Any more questions? Um, what do you think, you know, there's a lot of old people that you, fabulous, interesting people you've known for decades, and then there's your grandson. What do you think the mixture of, of uh, keeping up with the people that you've known and worked with all your life is relative to, to meeting new people? And, and, oh, I mean, one of, one of the things I mentioned that I was a Washington trip winner in the Westinghouse Science Town. It was, was the Westinghouse Science Town. Now it's the Intel Science Council. <laughs> and twice I've had the opportunity to go back and meet the current year winners, the 40 that win a trip to Washington. And it is so exciting to meet these young people and know there are young people out there who have this passion for technology. The, the one concern I have is there just aren't enough of them. In other words, the number of people that go to the effort of applying for that and I mean, the top prize is like $100,000 now. So the number should be a lot more. I figure how many college seniors are there? And how many have the, you know, the strength or the <laughs> commitment to go through, let's say, applying for a project like that? It's a relatively small percentage. Well, thank you for a fantastic talk. Uh, I encourage everyone to stay around and meet yeah. up outside instead of up at the podium to talk with Ted. Thank you. <laughs> okay.